You're working at the casino when a customer approaches you. She is going all in with the 20k that she just withdrew from her bank account. She's just traveled 90 miles to this particular casino in Louisiana, so you are extra polite. You ask her for her ID to humor her because she is clearly in her 50s. She gives you the ID with the name Pamela Hutchinson printed on it. But unbeknownst to you, Pamela Hutchinson is dead. And also the trophy, as a girl, you can't commit identity theft properly. Like, what, are you tripping criminal mind shit now? Like, it's calm it. Calm your tits. Tits were not calm during this case. Tits have not been calm. <laughs> Give me a second. Give me a second. <sighs> Why is the name Gone Bad is the game? I thought of changing the intro. So you know how I used to say, hey, I'm in the presence of greatness? Well, people misconstrued that. They thought I flipped it. I switched it. That I'm saying you are in the presence of greatness. And I was like, what? Like, my ego is big, guys, but I'm not freaking delusional. I meant you click out of every single icon out there on the internet about a true crime case. You clicked on mine. I'm in the presence of greatness because you have done that. But then, I guess being an immigrant makes your accent all weird. People get triggered. <laughs> Shut up. So let's put it, let's play the immigrant card so that those people feel bad. You feel good, but those people, let them feel bad. All right, what is this series all about, Maya? <laughs> Tell the people what this series is all about, Maya. Well, Gone Bad is about normal people, regular people like you and me, who have been living their lives, doing their normal jobs, and then one day they just switch to crime. And today we are talking about Louis Reese. I think it's Reese, could be Rice. I'm just gonna call her Louise from now on. So, without further ado, let's just uh, kick it with a story, because there is a lot, there is a lot. And this one partially takes place in Florida, so you know it's wild. We are first time traveling to 23rd of March 2018, when in Blooming Prairie in Minnesota, the small city with a population that was less than 2,000, David Reese's business partners called the police after 16 days of him failing to appear on the job. While conducting a welfare check, the police discovers David Reese's decaying body at the home that he shared with his wife. He had been shot to death at least once in the chest and once in the back. 14 days later, in Fort Myers Beach in Florida, on the 6th of April 2018, a body has been discovered after the hotel staff was cleaning out the room at the hotel. Body of Pamela Hutchinson has been found and the towels have been placed blocking the door airways, blocking the smell of the decaying body from reaching outside of that room. Most suspiciously, Pamela's ID was missing. What the police is yet to find out is how these two kills are connected. You see, at the first crime scene, they only found the body of a husband. As I told you, he shared that house with his wife. So, up until this point, they considered that his wife might have been a victim of foul play. Once they enter the details of the modus operandi using the same 22 caliber gun, leaving the bodies in the bathroom and trying to conceal the smell of the decomposing body, well, the police in Minnesota and the one in Florida started to communicate because they have spotted some similarities. Could this, in the end, have been a work of one person that up until this point they have been looking into, not as a suspect, but as a potential victim? To find that out, let us go into the timeline of the events first. David's wife, Louis, was born on February the 28th, 1962, in Rochester, and she was the fourth out of five children. Now her childhood... This is definitely a first, and I have been researching true crime cases for a while. So her dad was the provider for the family. He was the IBM engineer, so he was earning a substantial amount of money. But her mom was a hoarder. You see what I mean? A first. I have never researched a single criminal, or actually heard of a single criminal on a podcast, except from this one, obviously, where 
a family member has been a hoarder. I was like, okay, this is interesting. This might fuck her up in all different ways that we have not heard about it. Sure it will. So as a child, because her mom was a hoarder, she was quite embarrassed to like bring the friends into the house, of course, for obvious reasons. It doesn't go into specifics. It's not like a whole TLC episode where they tell you what the mom was hoarding. Boy. When you go down that rabbit hole, the TLC rabbit hole, it's just all sorts of weird. Oh, like I watched the grossest ones of the hoarding and ever since then I stopped with that one. I still watch the ones where, you know, people are objectophiles. <laughs> I have a specific TLC needs and people that make out with like cars or just like bridges or Eiffel Tower, favorites. Wrong story. Wrong criminal story. Mom was a hoarder. Louis found it embarrassing. Moving on. Dave was actually a year younger than Louis. He was born in 1963 in Rochester, Minnesota, and after finishing high school, he actually joined the Navy in San Diego. The two actually met at high school. They both attended Mayo High School, and obviously there was just a year difference. So when Dave was stationed in San Diego, around this time is when he married Louis. And he was only 19 and she was 20. And from the descriptions that everybody had on Dave, it just sounded like he was that character that was bigger than life. Loved to tell stories, would recommend you fishing spots, because as you'll come to realize, really into fishing, like next level into fishing, loved and respected his employees, and had like a really addictive laugh. I can't figure it out from everything I've read, but I like to picture it like Denver from La Casa de Papel, where it's like, uh, you know, that kind of laughter. I don't know why, it just amuses me to picture the laughter, to be like, uh, I can't, I can't even impersonate it. You can't even sound that deep. But yeah, this is how I imagine his laughter. So it was just like a character that was loved by everybody. From his children, his friends, his employees, nobody had a bad word to say about Dave. Eventually, Dave will finish serving at the Navy and he will move back to Rochester with Louis and the two of them will end up having three kids, two boys and a girl. This is when I put in the script, this is when it gets weird. It doesn't. It's just unusual. The way that their, like, parents had unusual childhoods, well, we only know about Louis, but, like, it's just unusual, okay? So David, as I told you, was really into fishing. So he opened this shop that was called Bait Box. It was the wax... Do it. It was the wax worm shop. So he sold worms. Don't ask me for an explanation. He sold worms. I don't know how they were packaged or whatever they used as bait, okay? That's as far as I know about fishing. While he was doing that, Louis had opened a daycare center, but she ran it from their home. Actually, the reason why Louis opened the daycare center was also quite interesting. So, their house caught on fire and was completely ruined. Like, they literally lost everything. And the whole community, like, all 1,900 people in the freaking Blooming Prairie actually joined up and gathered donations, enough donations to literally rebuild these people's house from scratch. Like, that community, you will not find that shit in London. So, Blooming Prairie community gets on it, and of course, once they rebuild her house, well, Louis felt grateful to a certain extent. So, she felt the way to recompensate and to pay back is to open a daycare center. And she really wanted to pay back. You get the sense that she was really trying to do the most. Like, she would have hot sandwiches for the parents that would be dropping off the preschoolers. She really felt, like, indebted in a certain degree with the community because they have helped her out so much. For years, the life goes on as normal. At this point, the two of them have been married for 25 years. And if you remember, they literally married, like, almost teenagers, 19 and 20. So, hey, big accomplishments, big ups right there. 
And of course, like at this point, their children kind of married young and started having children young. So they had both the children and the grandchildren now that they have been taking care of. They are taking care of these five grandchildren. Dave is doing his worm farming and worm selling and all things worms. And Louise is still running the daycare center now with like her own grandkids and other people's grandkids. And it's all like sort of in this community. But behind closed doors, beyond the nine to five or whatever the daycare center working times were, well, Louise had a bit of an issue. A gambling problem. From what I read, from all of the articles, I get the sense that the family knew, but it's not just about the family knowing, is that this wasn't in its initial stages. It seems that Louise has already struggled with addiction for years. Why do I say that? Well, because the stakes kind of were already high from everything I've read. Louise gambled away half a million dollars of her father's insurance, but that won't be where she will stop. She will have yet another victim in her family. And now this I couldn't find made clear whether or not her sister was already disabled, or I think she was disabled to a certain degree where she couldn't like have a job and had to have somebody to take care of her just to be present. But Louise took her chance and took an opportunity here to pull a freaking Jamie Spears and to ask for conservatorship on her sister. And she was granted one. So for a couple of years, she was taking care of her sister. Her sister was living with her. And she was also taking care, obviously, of her sister's bank account and her finances. And she, during that period of time, stole about $100,000 from her sister's account. I think later the family honed in on it after obviously they realized, well, the whole inheritance is gone and she has gambled it 40 minutes away in this Diamond Joe casino, just sort of a drive away from her house. And they're like, wow, okay, we need to look into what's happening with the sister. And obviously then they figured out that she has stole even more money from her. So I think they took away the conservatorship and she was never charged. Like, the family and the sister never pressed charges, even though this was really a felony. So she never spent any time in prison for it. And because she has never been charged, she just continued in her ways. And three years after this conservatorship, Dave will be found murdered. So now let's go back to the timeline, to March the 18th, picking up where we started, with the police finding Dave's body. So the police noticed a couple of things were off as soon as they made it to that scene. Like, the car wasn't there, Louis, his wife wasn't there, and as I told you at first, you have to suspect that, like, maybe she has been taken. Like, there have been kidnappings, there have been cases like that, where one person is murdered and then they take another one for ransom, to, like, ask family for more money, or they're just a sicko who targeted the wife in the first place to begin with. But then at the second glance, they're looking at the garage, like, around the house, and they don't see the car. So they're like, okay, if they were to take Louis, I mean, it's pretty dumb if they took her in her own car. Like, you know, we can track that down the license plate straight away. Like, we'll know her location within minutes. As they're looking into that, Dave's friends gather around, the police manage to contact them, and they go to the place of employment. So first things first, with his friends, between March the 8th and the 18th, when they found the body, the friends said, well, we haven't reported anything because we still received some form of communications from Dave. Now, we were suspicious of it, but still, it did come from his number, it did come from his phone. Why were we suspicious of it, you ask? Well, you see, something that not many people would know is that they have used dictation, is that what it's called? Like, once you kind of, like, speak into your phone and you sort of tell him what to send and then you say send and the message gets sent to your friends. I am, like, 90 years old. What the hell? This made zero sense, okay? Speech to dictation. Dictation to speech. He dictated his messages to the phone and then the phone sent them to his friends. 
So what that would mean is, of course, the phone is a freaking machine, so sometimes it joins up the words, like, most of the time. And usually it picks up on, like, ums, erms, like, poses that you do, and that's how it either makes gaps or it literally spells out, like, erm, things like that. And between March the 8th and the 18th, well, the messages that they received didn't reflect that. They weren't erms, erms, the text was never joined, and they were like, somebody's typing these messages. So either he has completely switched up the way that he actually texts people, or somebody else might have his phone. Why his co-workers haven't reported him missing, though, is because Louis actually appeared at his wax worm shop, bait box, whatever it's called, at his place of work a few times. The last time she appeared was about six days ago, so like March the 12th. So she would appear sort of every day and kind of like speak with the co-workers and they found it weird because, well, first of all, Louis had the whole daycare thing going on and she wasn't really interested into fishing. She never really appeared at her husband's job. But of course, like, she's the wife. Like, what the hell is... Like, what are you gonna say? So Luis would appear there and she would tell everybody, yeah, Dave is really sick. Like, came up to the floor. Please, nobody disturb him. If you can, just don't text, don't call. Just let him rest through it and he'll be back. He'll be back soon. Just leave it. Let it be a couple of days. And they were like, this is really weird. Like, Dave is not the person to ever take a sick day. But of course, like, yeah, if you are sick, like, it's your own business. Of course, we are not going to disturb him. Now, where my mind left when I read that was, okay, so for a couple of days after killing Dave, she was still living at that house, possibly, presumably, I mean, she could have been sleeping somewhere else, but in my head, she's still living with a dead body, because those situations I find super freaking disturbing, like, what are you doing with your life? And also, why she was appearing at his workplace was, well, for his checkbook, because the checkbook had, you know, his signature already there for a couple of checks, and she was taking some money out of his bank account. And actually, one of so many reasons why I find this story so bizarre, the day when they found David's body, Louis was still in Minnesota. She was still at Diamond Joe, that casino that was only 40 minutes around her house. Like, she was really close to home. She didn't probably even have a plan. And she was caught on CCTV camera in Diamond Joe, actually asking for directions about traveling south. And this is so frustrating for me because she was literally right there and logistically probably heard about the report of somebody finding a dead body. It was a small community. She probably heard it on the news. Whether it was at a casino place or a cafe or somewhere and she was spooked and she realized she had to actually flee and travel wherever she wanted to go to first as soon as possible. And the police officer that was assigned to this case, whose name was Ben Ball, and he was with the police force since 2009, so he wasn't really so green. Well, first of all, they interviewed the kids, and the kids were, like, in disbelief, but they do give them certain clues. They do tell them about their mom's gambling problem, and they also tell them, well, the weapon is missing from our house. It's a 22 caliber gun, so you should definitely be sort of on the lookout for that. And then the police themselves hone in on a few things. First set of clues that they find were the fact that Louis has been spending the past couple of days before they even found her husband's body, cashing out all of these checks to the amount roughly around $20,000, if you remember the beginning of this story. And then, once they find the CCTV footage from Diamond Joe's, well, they realize that she has also changed her appearance up a bit. She now has completely gray hair instead of her usual blonde. Now, the police does have some clues on her appearance, like what gun she might be having and how much money she has. But something that they can't really predict is, well, how long that money will last. Because, of course, the observation is she's gonna go to the next casino, wherever the hell it is. And then, depending on her luck, she might spend all of that money and not gain any in return. Or 
she might have some luck and get some money. So, like, they can't really predict, like, how long that money will last. And more frighteningly, what they can't predict is what she's going to do after the supply of the money depletes. And the police is concerned in particular about this money situation because by this point, they have done a deep dive into the history of Louise Reese. They have uncovered the whole situation with her sister, the fact that she should have probably spent some time in prison for felony theft for those charges, the fact that she nicked half a million dollars of her father's insurance, and yet again, she was never charged for that. But also the kids and the employees gave the police the insight of just how deep this went and just how desperate Louis was to keep this gambling addiction going. The kids told the police once Louis's dad died, she actually kept his remains like it was the ashes, but still, she didn't inter them, she didn't bury them anywhere where they designated the area for it because rather than doing that, she actually spent the money that was dedicating for the interment of the ashes on gambling, on going to Diamond Joe's. And the Worm Farm employees actually said that Luis approached them, asking them for donations for this golf cart that they would use to shuttle back and forth from the house. A vehicle that was just never bought this golf cart. She never bought it. She just took that money and again drove 40 minutes to her Diamond Joes to the same casino and just gambled it all away. And looking even further into the family history, everything kind of started to make sense. Like, the mom was a hoarder. The mom actually ended up in her late days being hospitalized in this clinic for the mentally ill due to her addiction. One of Louis's sisters was depressed, and, well, the other one was disabled and also required for people to take care of her. So the family collectively had some deep-rooted issues with mental health. But more than anything, it really painted a picture for the police of maybe the strain that this put on Louis and David's marriage. And the fact that he probably started honing in on it more and more. So, what if he realized, like, that she's trying to swindle his own workers, that she is now going to his place of work, trying to get people to give her money? What if he realized that she is already taking some money out of his personal bank account? That's probably the most probable option, that he actually just checked his bank account balance and realized, okay, this is Louis just cashing out the checks, just transferring this money. And what if he started up the argument and she couldn't get out of that situation? She couldn't avoid it, so she snapped. Taking her whole history into the account, it is visible to the police that this woman did commit felonies in the past in order to support her gambling addiction. So, what is to say that she won't escalate to murder in order to support it? So, before we continue with the timeline, let's talk about gamblers for a second, in particular female gamblers, because it doesn't happen as often, and when it does, it's a bit different than possibly what you imagine gambling as an addiction to be. So, did you know that compulsive gamblers usually fall into two basic categories? Men are usually thrill-seekers. So, they play these games with high stakes. They want to win big. Just think like Ocean, whatever it was, the one with the male crew. They're playing it to win big. But women are usually considered escape artists. They play the slot machines. They're not playing to hit the jackpot, but in order to enter this trance-like state. They are seeking a tool for mood management, in a way. They're seeking the way to numb their emotions, to shut out the world, and to have their time out. What fits with Louis's story is that with years of her gambling addiction, she did get isolated, and that is usually the profile of the gamblers. As the addiction progresses, they become more and more isolated, they display feelings of loneliness, of shame and guilt, and they do tend to cut ties with a lot of people that they were usually close to. So, when they spoke to Louis's friends, they would say, yes, I know Louis, but we haven't spoken in a while. And that was the pattern that everybody was giving the police, which kind of fits into this gambler's profile. 
Now, going back into the timeline, we have Louis on the CCTV footage. She is leaving Diamond Joe's and asking them how she can go south. So, after that, she takes I-35 route through Iowa and ends up in Florida. Next, the police will know of Louis is after they discovered Pamela's body. And then looking into this room, of course, this is completely different jurisdiction, it is a completely different state, so they have no idea still that the MO is the same. So they're looking at the crime scene and obviously somebody tried to conceal the smells. So they go to the hotel staff and they're like, um, why has nobody been to like clean this room? Why has nobody checked this room for like three days? Why is this body in such a stage of decomposition? How is it that we are only discovering it now? And the hotel staff says, well, actually, weirdly, I was on shift three days ago and this woman, well, supposedly Pamela Hutchinson, came downstairs and this woman, well, we suppose it is Pamela Hutchinson herself, came to the reception and asked us to extend her stay, to book this room for her for other three days. So we have only sent the cleaning staff now because she should have been checked out by this point. So the police is like, okay, give us the CCTV footage. Who, who is this woman? And they're looking at the CCTV footage and they're like, huh, there are some similarities. The woman in the footage does resemble Pamela to a certain degree. Her hair length is a bit different and I think like her hair just from this grainy footage looks white and kind of grayish compared to Pamela's blonde hair. But you could kind of mistake her for Pamela. And they immediately started connecting two and two. There is no other reason for Pamela's ID to be missing from that scene unless somebody is trying to assume her identity. The police had that confirmed further after they reviewed the surveillance videos from a Florida restaurant where they saw Louise's face and they saw her chatting with Pamela. And I just have to wonder, like, at what point does the thought cross your mind? Like, is it immediate? Was it immediate for Louis? Or did she just, like, chat her up for a bit and she realized, oh, hey, maybe somebody can mistake the two of us for each other? Because I don't see that much of a resemblance, especially when you look at her, like, pictures from later, from court, like, she has manic eyes, so I really don't see it. Like, Pamela had, like, such a nice, friendly smile, but I guess she realized, what other option do I have to, to commit identity fraud this fast in 2018? I can only do one thing to steal her ID. I don't think she's thinking logically at this point whatsoever. She's just thinking about how to make it to the next casino and it's truly one of the saddest freaking stories. Please tame your addictions. If you have one, tame it. Tame the motherfucker. Don't ever let it get to this degree. Pamela, who was 59, was actually in Florida for a reason. What we know about her is that she loved to stay out late, she loved to spend her holidays in Mexico, she was a successful car saleswoman in Virginia Beach before she divorced her husband about two years prior to her death and moved to Bradenton, Florida. And this particular week that she was there, she traveled down to Fort Myers Beach because she found a condo that she wanted to buy. So she just went there to view it and make a final decision. While she was there, she also used any chance she can get to meet with her friend Donna. You see, Donna's husband actually just ended up committing suicide, so Pam was there to comfort her, to help her spread the ashes, and to really just help her with the pain. But then one night Donna remembers that Pam kind of passed up the opportunity to meet with her. And the reason why Pam didn't meet up with her is that she wanted to meet up with this new friend that she has made. So Donna of course isn't fast, like Pam is planning to move to this place anyways and to buy this condo, she does need to make other friends. And this friend will of course end up being Louise Reese. And that night, Donna texted Pam, like, hey, are we still on, like, for spreading my husband's ashes? Like, are you gonna appear here with, like, the rest of the family? And she gets no reply. So she's like, okay, maybe she's still in the bar with this new friend that she met. Do I, do I know this friend's name? 
I don't actually know any information on this person. But, you know, she kind of, like, drops it. Obviously, she's preoccupied with what is going on currently. But around that same time, before 7 p.m., the person that is to sell Pam her condo, well, she isn't getting any response from Pam. She has just, like, literally sent her all of the documents. She's just waiting for the final signatures and the money transfer. And this seller is thinking, well, she must be having the buyer's remorse. She must have just not wanted this condo in the end. So nobody's really raising the alarm bells at this point. And as we know, the hotel won't raise the alarm bells because... Well, they thought that Pamela Hutchinson wanted to prolong her stay for another three days. On that note, when Louise obviously went to this hotel staff counter, well, she had to show Pamela Hutchinson's ID, probably had to memorize all of the details just in case already. So that just goes to say that she didn't take too much time to make this decision. It was probably made as the two of them were drinking in the bar, and she probably realized either somebody called them sisters, or, you know, that the age gap is close enough, and she was like, well, we look alike enough for this to pass. And obviously, she had the money from her husband and from all of the gambling to pay for the free extra days for Pam, so the hotel won't have any reason to raise any red flags with the police at first. Back into the timeline with the discovery of Pamela Hutchinson's body, now the police in Florida sends out the Bolo alert, be on the lookout alert, and when Ben Ball from Minnesota sees this, he realizes the similarities and he realizes this is Louis Reese. So Ben rings the police in Florida, they compare the notes, they realize all of the similarities, and the U.S. Marshals elevate the search to a major case. What this means is that they're looking for a wanted person. They set up a $5,000 reward, a national hotline, and post the billboards with her face and name on them all around Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and Nevada. Louise didn't only stop at the identity theft. She also also stole Hutchinson's money, withdrawing around $5,000 from her bank account, and also stole her car. And now, with around 20 k from, like, what was left over from her gambling days, and also from her husband's account, and these $5,000, she had around 20 k and she was headed southwest, stopping at Louisiana. With the police being three days behind, they find out that the murder of Pamela Hutchinson could have been prevented. Well, they don't go publicly and admit that, but I'm telling you. But they knew. Why? Because a witness comes forward. And this witness, four days prior to discovery of Pam Hutchinson's body, actually rang 911. Why did she ring 911? It's because she found this woman lurking in her area. And it wasn't just any woman. It was a woman that this witness named Tess saw on the news as literally, like, the most wanted face. And she sees this woman in front of her house, sort of like parking up a car, like, in front of a bar in Fort Myers. And then they clock eyes, and Louis realizes, okay, I have just been recognized. So she just says something like, wrong house, and literally, like, pulls out of that parking lot and speeds away. And when Tess called 911, well, they kind of passed her between, like, Minnesota police and, like, Florida police, and everybody was saying, like, oh, yeah, they weren't actually in charge of the case. Like, what the hell? They literally passed this woman as a hot potato, like, oh, yeah, we don't just believe, like, what, she was just barking up in front of your house. Silly you, yeah, as if a criminal is just, like, walking around all confident. So, on this occasion, they bring Tess into the police station in Fort Myers, and they show her an array of pictures. And in every single array, she perfectly managed to spot Louis Reese from those lineups. As a pattern in this case, they are about hundreds of miles behind, because Louis is 21 hours away at the island of South Padre. 
On this island, Louise went back to her old tricks. She would go gambling, but she also was very amicable in these bars. And this was, yet again, a smaller place. Maybe not the best of the locations, but when found, the police would suspect that she was actually in South Padre because of the close proximity to the Mexican border. So in these bars, she would sit down and start making friends. She was telling people her name is Donna. I suspect that this is because, obviously, at this point, Pam's body was found. So if she was to give Pamela Hutchinson's ID, well, that wouldn't work because people knew that she was dead. She just didn't think this through. She was like, okay, if I had three days and now I have to start assuming somebody else's identity, I guess. I didn't really think this identity theft through. So she would sit next to usually women, usually women around her age at these bars and would be really friendly. And this bar owner, Kathy, actually remembers Louise and she said, like, if she asked me for a job, I would have hired her. She had such great people skills. She would bond with people and build rapport over all different kinds of things. She said, like, she had been widowed and is looking to buy a condo here. And she would also say, oh, I've been to Florida, you know, just before this, like, sort of looking to maybe move there. Loads of old people could not stand it. And they're like, aren't you, like, a bit, you know in your 50s, like, how old are we talking about? Like, when is Florida just filled with, like, people who are 100 years old? What? But the women that she spoke with had kind of a different story to tell. Like, yeah, she was pleasant, she would always smile, like, laugh, bust jokes, but then she would kind of get weird. Like, she started always the conversation about how we, the women that she was chatting up with, shouldn't really stay on this island for too long. It started off friendly, and then it just leads to us feeling pressured to leave this place. And we always thought, well, why? Before she managed to lure another victim, she did want to experiment another place. She wanted to try this best seafood of South Padre. And, of course, well, when she looked that place up, this place called Dirty L's popped up. So she just sat there, asked to look at the menu, and the waiter obviously started chatting her up. Like, she is all, like, chatterbox for somebody who is a criminal. She freaking talks a lot. And that will be her downfall. Because the manager at Dirty Alice is kind of observing her, you know? He's probably, like, hiding, like, behind a tray, like, sort of, like, in the kitchen area. And he's just looking at her as she lifts her head to, like, speak to the waiter. And then as she kind of dips it down to look at the menu, and he's like, where have I seen this woman? I remember this bleached hair. I remember the face. Where the hell have I seen her? And then it clicks. CBS. He saw her on the news this very morning. And as he is literally, like, to call the police, the waiter is like, oh, yeah, yeah, she just left. Like, we didn't have any actual seating at the bar area, and she kind of wanted to eat at the bar. I think she just went next door. Like, why? What's up? And he's like, okay, I need to call the police straight away, because this woman is literally like, the most wanted one in the area, okay? You know, like, all of these women not wanted her, wanted. The police gets called, and now this man is literally, like, sweating, because he's like, what if she literally drove away? Like, I can't go next door to the restaurant, like, just to check up on her. She might remember me or this waiter. Like, I can't just send my man to, like, keep her there. So he's literally there, like, oh my god, is the police one last time going to be behind her again? There has been a manhunt for this woman for weeks. But luckily, the police does arrive, and there is this footage, and it's like three of them just sort of standing, kind of blocking the exit. I was like, this was a quiet day at South Padre, okay? They had like no other events going on. They had no other locations to be at because the whole police force was in this little freaking bar. So somebody just kind of like hushes her. Because again, she's just engaged in conversations with people. She's just unsuspecting, like, of anybody. So one police officer kind of just, like, pokes her and probably tells her, like, you know, hey, Louise, it's over, bitch. Like, it, it's over. And she just surrenders. She didn't make a scene. And what the officer said was also that she didn't have a single emotion on her face. Like, she was just like, huh, I guess. 
Yes, I'm about to be arrested. Fuck it, lasted as long as it could have. So, on April the 19th, 2018, Louis Reese was finally, finally arrested. On her, they found a map, they found this brochure from a casino nearby, they found pill bottles, piles of clothes, including this white fedora that they saw on the surveillance video, so they could, by that, connect her definitely to Pam Hutchinson, even though her face is clearly showing on that CCTV footage. She also kept things like tissues and soap, the towel from the marina village. So, like, everywhere she went, like, to these hotels and condos, she put, like, you know, how you steal soap from a hotel. Yeah, she did that, but she was a criminal, so... Do you consider yourself a criminal when you do that? No, it comes for free. Let me remind you, I'm not the one on trial here, okay? It's a little shampoo bottle. It's cute. You, you take that. Most incriminatingly, though, they found Pamela's checkbook, four credit cards, a black bag with bullets, a holster, duct tape, rubber gloves, the handgun one, the 22 caliber one, and then they found, like, a second 9mm handgun as well. And also, what I find bizarre is that they found what they thought to be a trophy, which was... Pamela's sunglasses wrapped in a hand towel. To me, this case just goes beyond, because uh, I watched Mike from that chapter cover this case, and he kind of insinuates that he thinks that Louise just snapped, and I was like, no, she did not just snap. This, if any single case that I have covered, this one has, like, a clear progression, where somebody starts off from small, and then the stakes get higher, and then finally they end up murdering a person, or two in this case. And also the trophy, I was like, girl, you can't commit identity theft properly. Like, what, are you tripping criminal mind shit now? Like, it's calm it. Calm your tits. Tits were not calm during this case. Tits have not been calm. Just like her crime spree, well, her trial didn't really go without hiccups. Her crimes went between the two states. So, at first, she was prosecuted in Florida for murder, for auto theft, for identity theft, grand theft, and because mostly of the two homicides that she has committed, she actually was to face even possibly a death penalty. But then she realized she would rather spend her time in the prison in Minnesota, closer to her family, friends, her children, and for that, well, she had to plead guilty to murdering her husband, which at first she didn't do. And also she had to be extradited to Minnesota and try there and obviously face the risk of getting a harsher sentence for the death penalty to be off the table, because there, there will be more witnesses, people know her, people will be making impact statements. And her trial in Minnesota, get this, actually only happened a year and a half later because of overburden, justice system, whatever the hell I read there. I mean, she was in prison all of that time. But then she was extradited and tried in December 2019. She got assigned a court-appointed defender, which, again, interestingly enough, is this person named Lori Trow. later went on to defend Derek Chauvin, the murder of George Floyd. So that person clearly makes great decisions in life, or they just get assigned to, like, the shittiest cases by the court. And this defense lawyer decided to play the sympathy card, but what this also meant was to re-victimize the victim. On the day of the crime, March the 11th, the two of them were arguing, Louis and Dave, and then Dave actually told her to get a gun and kill herself, and to do it right this time. This defense attorney will go on to later showcase Louise's mental health, medical history, and also to show that Louise actually attempted to commit suicide earlier on in her life, and that she has been hospitalized, insinuating that, obviously, David knew this, and that during this quarrel, he pulled this argument out in order to hurt her. But instead, she has snapped, she took the gun, and shot him straight at his heart. Before the sentencing, the family will make the impact statements. There was this social worker that actually read the first one on behalf of Dave's elderly mother. That's, like, so painful in these cases that his mother actually was still alive, outliving her son and her son's murder. 
So he read this. When you killed David, you took my heart. David was the family's ray of sunshine. I will never forgive you. Dave's sister Cindy was next, and she said that her brother died just so a cold-blooded murderer could satisfy her gambling addiction. Her kids then read their impact statements saying how they will never be able to forgive her, that they cannot process the fact that she killed their own dad, and that by doing that they basically lost both their dad and their mom. And one of her daughters actually said that she gets haunted by just thinking what maybe she could have done in order for her mom to cure her addiction and never to be able to commit any of her murders. Then Louise read her statement and she said that it was because of David's bravery that the children are this way, so she sort of tried to, like, extract herself out of the situation for like a split second. And then she said, I didn't know how much pain I was in until I wasn't anymore, which I find interesting. I mean, by that point, probably all of the withdrawals from the actual addiction were gone because she already spent like a year and a half in prison. So she could probably see everything rationally, but unfortunately, it was too late. She was sentenced to serve two life terms without the possibility of parole. One for the murder of Pamela Hutchinson, and then one for the murder of her husband, Dave Reese. And that is truly everything that there is to this case. I thought this was going to be a short one. I just need... I'm not a short-form person, as you know. But I need to know what you're thinking about this case. Do you agree with Mike from that chapter that she just snapped? That it was just a flip switch from one moment to another? We, of course, only have one side of that argument that happened in their house. And something, whether it is the pattern that this defense lawyer is implementing in, it appears, two of the cases that now I know about, which is to vilify the victim, or... In the fact that she maybe personally chose to do that tells me that it probably didn't happen. Just from the accounts that people have on Dave, I don't think that he was that type of person that would just snap and say something. And even if he did, even if he did, it's not a reason for you to take a gun and kill somebody. Or do you see the escalation the way that I do? Where she started off small, she probably started off taking smaller amounts of money, then aiming at one family member, then the other, then the co-workers of David, and then David himself, and then suddenly she was probably in this crisis when she realized, well, who is going to supply and fund this addiction any longer? She completely lost control of the situation and realized, well, I'm out of people to get the money from, so... I have to do something about it. And if they're not alive, that will give me at least a few days, up until their bodies are discovered, to steal either their identity, because we are a look-alike, or their money, until the police plasters the wanted posters all around the town and figures out that I'm maybe going across the border. That's it for me, though. Until we meet for Katie Up's video tomorrow, you please beware of the people that are befriending you at random at bars and selling you weird-ass story and asking you to leave your holiday resort. Yeah, I did it. That is not a joke. Mm-mm. The office, the American office, taught us the best. That was one of the best episodes from the later seasons, where, like, Pam pretended that Jean is Asian and that she has an Asian child and was mocking Dwight into, like, oh, Jean was always Asian. I don't know why. It's just, like, such a retarded comedy stunt, and I still love that episode with a passion. (laughs) What are you on about? I need to exit this video, so I just when I get out and leave you some outtakes and then I'll see you all tomorrow. All right? All right. I don't know, bye. I'm going through menopause. Is this how you find out? Wait, you're 28. I mean, it's not like I plan to have kids. Can you stop beeping so I can continue telling a story? Okay, cool. Thank you, car. Car owner. Thank you. Another thing why I'll never drive because I'm mentally unstable. Okay. <laughs> Do you ever think you know, when you die, like, will people not uh, have a bad word to say about you? No, they'll just bitch. <laughs>
to be like, I don't care that she's a victim of a crime. Please don't make me a victim of a crime. Why did you just, in the imaginary story, make yourself a victim of a crime? They were like, they'd be like, she was Scorpio and proud. Like, what was that all about? <laughs> like, no. She had to get the grip. Literally, like, one quality and, like, 20 floors. And I'm, like, from hell haunting their ass. But they're like, fuck, bitch. You should be saying that I lit up a fucking room. Lie. Just lie. Like, my body analysts will be able to see if we are lying. Lit up a room, okay? Vanished into thin air. All the stereotypes. Use them on me. Why would they? If you're a victim of a crime, because I'm a ghost, that's why I'm vanishing into thin air. Oh. My god, today's just not the day where you tell a story straight, is it? Does anybody have a person in their life that dyed their hair completely gray on purpose? I had a physics teacher like that and we were just always like... Because it made her look so much older. Like, she was probably still like in her 40s, at best like 50 when she was teaching. And she kind of gave us that like devil looks Prada whole look and her character was like that. So it was all fitting, but it was like, why? Something I'm doing that is very easy. I give up, and it's not really easy, but I give up one thing each month. So like this month, I'm kind of giving up like artificial sugars. Next month will be bread. Caffeine still the hardest one, but hey, it has to be done. And you sleep like a baby. Test out what you are really dependent on. Give it up for a month, then you give up another thing next month. And of course, that doesn't involve like vegetables, fruits, the food that actually is there for the sustenance, it's like the food that you can be addicted to, or caffeine and stuff, you know, just pay me. Never get addicted to a single thing, I beg of the addictions are, are fucked up. The moral Maya corner that you have probably all sped up to, did anybody listen? Password, moral Maya, in the comments if you have, no, so, to confuse everybody. Louis didn't only stop, it's like, Every time it's like, that it up is not a joke. I always remember Dwight from the office, the American office. Well, it's always close here, close to the chest. Mm -mm -mm. That was loved by everybody, from his children, his wife, the... <laughs> maybe not, maybe not his wife. <laughs> no spoiler story. They know, they see it in the title, they know she killed him. The level of upper body strength that I don't have, I just struggle to open sparkling water bottle. This ain't a pickle jar. I had to like get a claw to open like no, no, no. <laughs> Simply do not accept, cannot accept the fact that I just could not open a sparkling water bottle. 